All right, let's go ahead and turn your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 3. just want to uh, share just a few thoughts in continuation, um, in continuation with what I shared last Friday. Um, as many of you know, we're getting ready for this uh, special weekend, August uh, 5, 6, and 7, uh, Chris Reed and, and Wellington Boone. And on the 5th, Friday night the 5th, uh, both our staff service and our EGS service, uh, Wellington Boone uh, will be uh, sharing both services, and Chris Reed will be ministering uh, with him uh, at the end of the 7.30 service. And then on um, Saturday morning at 10 a.m., we'll all uh, jump into the prayer room and just going to ask the Lord for the release of uh, John 17, anointing on the body of Christ, as the Lord prophesied in John 17, uh, for the spirit of unity to come um, on the church in an increased way. Uh, then uh, in the afternoon, there'll be a panel discussion uh, with Wellington Boone and myself and some others. And then uh, in the evening, Saturday, uh, Chris Reed will be ministering here. And then Wellington Boone will be uh, sharing both services on Sunday morning, both first and the second service. And the focus of this, uh, of this special weekend will be uh, preparing and, and, and getting into a conversation to prepare our hearts uh, for the increasing uh, racial conflict that already exists within the land. And it's only going to increase simply, uh, we know that simply because Jesus said that it would. In Matthew 24, 7, he said, nation against nation. And so uh, Ephesians chapter 3, let's pray. And I just want to share a couple thoughts and then we'll go from there. Father, Lord, we thank you for uh, your word Father, we thank you, Lord, that you, uh, that you unveiled, Father, the deep things that are on your heart, Father, concerning the, the reconciling, Father, of ethnic groups that are formerly hostile towards one another, even in greater fashion, Jew and Gentile, Father, the mystery, Lord, that you gave to your servant Paul. Father, we ask you that you would open up our hearts, Father, to your law. Father, we want to see things in your word. Father, we ask you for... ISAF, Lord, we ask you for uh, uh, the light of your spirit, Father, to illumine our minds, to, uh, to illumine our hearts. Lord, we, uh, Lord, you promised, uh, Jeremiah 33, 3, Lord, that if we call to you, Lord, that you would answer and you would show us great and mighty things. So, Father, we ask you, Lord, in this hour, Lord, we ask you that you would uh, continue to unlock our hearts, Father, by letting us see, Lord, letting us, letting us peer, Father, into the things that are near and dear to you, called the mystery of Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the, in, uh, in Ephesians, chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, I just want to give you a couple of Bible verses, because again, part of the goal last week was to uh, give a biblical or a gospel perspective on the subject of race. Uh, we started with Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where the Apostle Paul uh, says that we are to not to be uh, conformed uh, to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. And as I was thinking about that verse this week, I just couldn't but help to think really partly of the, uh, the, the word and the promise that the Lord spoke to Mike in Cairo, Egypt. He said, I will change the understanding and expression of Christianity and the whole earth in one generation. And, and Mike has given several points in that in terms of what that means. But the point I want to highlight is that when the Lord said, I want to change the understanding, he's saying, I'm going to mess with your thinking. Uh, I, I, want to, I want you to change the way that you think, uh, of course, in this case, about Christianity. And so this whole issue of not being conformed to this world, I think, is part of the changing of the understanding of Christianity in this particular case when it comes to uh, the subject of racial conflict. Uh, all too often, uh, what we find ourselves doing is we find ourselves gravitating towards uh, uh, the, the, uh, the political ideologies or the ideologies of different social media characters and, and whatnot and uh, um, that are not really lining up uh, with the gospel. One of the reasons, by the way, why this happens, I believe, is because when we hit these racial flashpoints like we've had, like we've had in the last four or five years, one of the reasons why we gravitate towards these ideologies is because we're more than likely are reacting to the crisis rather than responding to the crisis. 
And one of the reasons why we react to the crisis, many believers react to the crisis, is because we've not yet been fully convinced that the gospel actually has something to say to us about the issue of, of, uh, of ethnic conflict and ethnic reconciliation. That it, it's actually, it's more than having something to say. I believe it is very central to the gospel. Is the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation between God and man, and the reconciliation of humanity, of redeemed humanity, is very, very essential to the gospel, as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so, the more, it's, the more that we grow to understand that truth, the more that we begin to make it a part of our spiritual diet. We, make, we, we begin to make it a part of our interaction with the Lord so that when these flashpoints hit, we actually have heaven's perspective according to the word in terms of how to respond. Secondly, there's lots of things to be said about the subject, but the but the, the thing that is on my heart is really simple. It is a gospel understanding of the issue, number one. And number two, a gospel response to the issue, meaning that we as the body of Christ are called to be a witness in the midst of a, a ethically uh, a, 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 a tense culture. We're to be a witness of how a gospel people can live together from all different ethnic groups. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, and the reason why I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22 is because of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, for this reason. Now, how many of you know that when, uh, when, when we actually pay attention to the reason, it's amazing how the, the scriptures actually begins to unlock Right when, the, when, when he says, therefore, or for this reason, or but, these conjunctions actually call us to go back just a few verses and to see what it is that is being said there. And what Paul is saying here, he says, what is the reason? The reason is this, is that the Father is building a house of worship in which his fullness can dwell. I'm going to say this again. The Father is building a house of worship in which his fullness can dwell, in which the fullness of his glory, the fullness of his expression, his power, his purpose, his personality or his character, the fruit of the spirit, the full expression of God's glory to be expressed. And that is what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, look, the Father is building a house, a house of, of if we can just turn my mic down just a little bit, it would be great, thank you. Uh, he says, uh, building a house, perfect, thank you, uh, building a house of worship in which the fullness, the full expression of who he is will dwell. That is the reason. And so it's not about politics. It's not even about, dare I say, um, America keeping up the good name of the United States of America, though I, would, I appreciate the country being united. I'm not putting that down. But it's not about the United States of America. It's not even about the politics. It's about the Father's desire that before Genesis 1, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in that Trinitarian fellowship, they are interacting with one another. And Jesus saw something in the heart of the Father. And the Father saw something in the heart of the Son and the Spirit as well. And it's the, it is the desire of God to have a people that would be forged together into a house of worship in which the fullness of God's glory and God's presence will be made manifest. In John chapter 4, familiar passage, is the uh, story where Jesus goes and, uh, um, and he ministers to the Samaritan woman. The thing that uh, stands out to me about that passage, that is just so amazing, is that all throughout the gospel, Jesus mentions the worship of his father, but no place like in John 4 does Jesus lay out with some real detail of what it is that the Father is after insofar as worship. And here's the thing that strikes me. What strikes me is that Jesus crosses a cultural barrier to, uh, to, uh, to communicate this truth. He, he crossed a cultural barrier. He crossed the... Uh, the, 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 this, this barrier of hostility between Jew and Gentile, and that's the context that he chooses to, uh, to express to the Samaritan woman. He goes, the Father, the Holy One of Israel, desires even you to be a part of this house of worship in which the fullness of who he is will be made manifest. And so I believe that 
that the end time worship movement that the Lord is raising up in the earth, of which we are a part of, that, this end, that the end time worship movement all across the nation through the body of Christ, I will believe, believe will be the premier context where the healing of ethnic and racial divides will take place because the thing that the Father is after is after a unified house of worship in which his glory can be fully be made known. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul continues, he says, for this reason, he says, I'm in prison, he says. He says, in fact, I'm in prison for you Gentiles. And, uh, and you go, okay, well, what's going on over here? Well, when Paul writes uh, this to the, uh, to the church of Ephesus, he is in a Roman jail cell. And the reason why he ended up in that Roman jail started in Acts chapter 21. And what happened in Acts 21 is Paul takes says allegedly, but he probably did, takes Trophimus, who happened to be an Ephesian, and he takes him into the temple, and he takes him beyond this wall that was called the Wall of Hostility. And the inscription on this wall was really intense. It says that if anyone would go beyond that wall or would bring anyone beyond that wall, that they were responsible for the death that would come their way. And that was known as the Wall of Hostility. But here's the point. Paul says, I'm in prison for you, he says, for this reason, Paul says, I'm in prison. And the reason why he's in prison is because of the situation with Trophimus. But back to the verses before, Ephesians 2, 19 and 22, that, was, is, that is what fueled Paul's understanding to take a stand for, for Trophimus. Here he is in the temple, and there is this wall of hostility that says that he's not allowed to bring a Gentile past that wall. And Paul knows by revelation because of his understanding of the gospel. He goes, no. He goes, the Father, the Holy One of Israel, wants a house of worship in which his fullness will be made, will be made known. And his house of worship will be made of every nation, tribe, and tongue, and language. Yes, I'm bringing him past this wall. And I know what, it is, what this is going to cause. It's going to cause a riot. They're going to get angry with me. They're even going to want to kill me because of the stand. And so Paul was not motivated by some, uh, again, some humanistic or political ideology. He was moved by something that he saw in the heart of God, which is why he says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, for this reason. And the reason is, is depicted in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, that God wants this house of worship in which his fullness would dwell. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3 Paul talks about this thing called the mystery, and we talked a little bit more about that last week, but as another way of saying the mystery is something that is in the heart of God. He says, he says, I've made known to you my understanding of the mystery, or another way to say it, I've made known to you the understanding that was given to me about what it is that lies deeply within the heart of the Father, because that is the thing that drives me. That is the thing that motivates me. And that's the thing that I believe that the Lord is inviting us into in this season. As Matthew 24, nation against nation, is on the horizon. It's only going to increase. He's inviting the church into a different conversation that is, that's different than, again, our, our favorite YouTube personality, whether left or right. He says, no, I'm calling you into something deeper. I'm calling you into understanding the nature of my heart, which, again, it bears repeating that he wants a house of worship in which his fullness can be expressed. You know, the apostle Peter, you know, he says that, uh, that, this, that this house is made out of, out of living stones. And, and I imagine the father, you know, being the, the ultimate divine artist, he goes, I don't want a house of living stones that all, have to like, that all have one color. He goes, no, I want every color, size, and shape, and expression to be a part of this building. In fact, the only building that I'm comfortable in is a building that is made up out of living stones that are made from every nation, tribe, and tongue, even the ones who have a history of hostility. I'm so committed to it. I'm so desirous of it that my gospel through the cross and the blood of my son would tear down every wall of, of hostility and, and so that my glory can come, it can dwell, and be fully expressed to the nations. And you know, and this is where the John 17 promise really does come in, where you know, he's, uh, Jesus says, Father, he says, let them be one as you and I are one, that the world may know that you have loved them and that you have sent me, Jesus Christ, the only, son, the only one. And so uh, this is about the glory of God. This is not about 
Again, this is not about the donkey or the elephant or who did this, who did, uh, who did this, who did what. It is about the dream of the father. You know, I think of uh, you know, Martin Luther King who stood on the White House and he says, I have a dream. And I imagine the father going, I have a dream. I have a dream. And that is the dream that he wants us to be connected with. Paul calls it the mystery of God. All right, lastly, Ephesians chapter, uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. A couple of thoughts out of Colossians chapter 3. I really believe that if we were to uh, take the Lord up on his offer, so to speak, to, uh, uh, to engage our hearts and to equip us and to help us understand how to move forward, um, he really will. And he really will respond uh, to us. It's uh, like one guy said, it is a matter of grace, not a matter of race. It's, it's about understanding the, um, uh, the fullness of the grace of God. And uh, we will talk about it a bit more uh, at another time. But there are many passages where Paul is expounding on the glory of the grace of God, of what it is that we have received through the gospel. And then based upon that, as we'll see in this particular passage, and based upon that, he calls us to respond and live in a way that is, uh, that is deserving of who Jesus is as it pertains to people from um, other uh, ethnic groups. Now, uh, when it comes to the black and white issues specifically, you know, uh, people say, well, why is it always about black and white? Well, that's because that's the one that's most pronounced within the culture. And, uh, and the Lord is, he's, he's, he's efficient in the way that he operates. And so it is, I believe, not the only, but I believe it's the primary training ground for us as the people of God. That whatever principles we learn as we actually begin to engage in understanding how to relate with one another as it pertains to the hostility that has existed between black and white. It will equip us to how to relate with other, uh, uh, other ethnic groups. It will give us insight how to be peacemakers uh, uh, in other ethnic situations. And then ultimately, it will really help us understand how to walk out this, uh, uh, this whole issue between the Jew and Gentile, which is really the ultimate um, hostility. You know, uh, I have not had a chance to really look into this, but uh, how many of you guys have seen uh, a Hotel Rwanda, right? Now, that was an example of nation against nation, the two people groups, right? the, 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 uh, the Hutus and the Tutsis, how they were at, at war um, uh, with each other. And you know what? I've often wondered, how did the church walk that out? You know, how did the, uh, the Hutus that were believers and the Tutsis that were believers, how did that play itself out? And these are the kinds of things that that we're talking about when we're talking about ethnic strife and ethnic hostility, where even in the worst um, uh, uh, context of hostility, there is a gospel expression that exists that can actually help us overcome our hearts, our fears, our prejudices, our biases, and so forth, and that we can walk with one another in love. In Colossians chapter 3, just I want to give you just one, two, three, just a couple of thoughts. And uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, in short, the Apostle Paul is expounding on the grace of God. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 10, excuse me, 3, verses 1 to 10, he's saying, here's the grace of God. I mean, there are at least four, and probably more, but there are at least four very, 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 very powerful components of the grace of God that Paul gives. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you some of them. Number one, he talks about our ascension as believers, that we have access to the throne of God that we've been given a place of privilege, authority, and dignity in the presence of God as believers. When we were born again, something very powerful happened, that we came into that place of ascension to be seated in heavenly places, number one. Number two, this is interesting. Here's what Paul says. He says, set your mind there. He goes, let that truth be the thing that informs your thinking, not your nationality, not your ideology, not your politics. Don't let that be the thing that informs you. Let the thing what informs you is this new identity as believers where we are given a privilege, an authority, and a dignity to be seated on thrones in the very presence of God. Huge subject, but it's absolutely essential to knowing how to move forward on this issue. And so Paul says in chapter 3, verse 2, he says, set your, mind there, uh, uh, set your mind there. In other words, 
Ask the Lord for insight about, this, about these truths. Ask him to make them known to you. Ask him to bring it into an experiential dimension in terms of our emotions, the way that we think and feel about ourselves and the way that we think and feel about one another. Because part of where this thing is going is that if, if, a, if a Jewish person who is born again knows that they are seated in heavenly places and they know that a Gentile is born again and seated in heavenly places, all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, both Jew and Gentile have been given the same privilege, authority, and dignity? This is absolutely amazing. And the same would be true when it comes to the black and white issue, right? Is that, wait a minute, if a white person is seated in heavenly places in Christ and a black person is seated in heavenly places in Christ, then wow, then all of a sudden we realize that through the gospel, we all have been given the same privilege, authority, and, and dignity in the grace of God. Thirdly, is uh, verses 3 to 9, I won't go into all of it. But it's where he tells us that because of this identity, this new identity of being seated in heavenly places, that we put aside the old man. A giant uh, subject, but I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, highlight this. This is a familiar passage to you. It's Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. He says, I, Paul, no longer live, but, the, but Christ is the one who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live through the power of Christ. Here's what's important about that verse. That verse is in the context of Paul uh, being in Antioch and, uh, and Peter is talking to, to the Gentiles. They're just kind of chumming it up, kind of doing their thing, having a good time talking. And all of a sudden, the bros from Jerusalem show up and when Peter and Barnabas eventually see the bros from Jerusalem show up, they actually begin to back off from the conversation that they were having with the Gentiles. They begin to back up, and there's lots of reasons for it, but they did not want to see or be seen as associating with the Gentiles. And Paul is watching this thing unfold, and he is not happy. <laughs> and he calls it, an affront to the gospel. He said, this is actually an insult to the gospel, what you're doing. And, and it's in that context, he says, Peter, don't you, and he, he opposes Peter publicly, he says, Peter, don't you know that I, Paul, he goes, your problem is, he says, you're too connected with your Jewishness in this particular situation. He says, I, Paul, I said, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. But Christ in me, I, I'm living from a, an entirely different reality. Beloved, this thing about our identity in Christ, um, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take us beyond um, just the moral issues, so to speak, that we deal with in our lives. I, and yes, by all means, let's start there. But this thing about our identity in Christ, it, where it will go, it, it's... Well, I was not going to go there, but here I go. It's, it, it's, no, 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 no. Please, please think with me through this for a second, okay? Here we are as, as born-again believers. We love the Lord. Uh, we're, by the grace of God, the Lord's given us an international footprint, and we are connected with brothers and sisters, you know, this international family of affection, right? Just all across the nations. It's been one of our privileges. Now, imagine this. Think about... This, that some of the countries where we've got these brothers and sisters that we love with, that, that we love, our country, United States of America, is at odds with those people, with those countries. And so, you know, when we know that, all of a sudden we're, ah, oh, we're stuck, we're like, ah, oh. you know, we can get all political and say, yes, let's drop bombs on these people. It's like, well, our brothers and sisters live there. And it, it just creates this, this, this conundrum on the inside, and, not, and I'm not addressing them on whether we should or shouldn't. That is not my comment. My comment is about it just puts us in this gospel dilemma of intercession and saying, Lord, what is your way for? What is your word? What is your direction? What is, what is your wisdom? What is it that you have to say uh, to us? And so this issue of the identity and the grace of God goes, uh, goes far beyond ways that we can even begin to imagine the church of the end time church of the Revelation 19, when they're saying hallelujah because of the destruction of Babylon, that is a church that is deeply connected with her citizenship and her identity in the age to come. Okay, 
Well, Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, the Apostle Paul, so he tells us that we are ascended. Number one, number two, we're to set our minds there. Number three, that we're to put off our old identity. Number four, that we are to grow in the knowledge of God, that as we grow in the knowledge of God, we grow in the knowledge of who he is, his power, personality, and purpose, that it will perpetually renew our hearts and it will strengthen us in these realities that are being talked about over here in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 9 in particular. Now I want to draw your attention to verse, uh, to verse 11. Verse 11 is that one verse that we skip over. You know, there's verses we skip over and there are parts of the Bible where the pages are stuck together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, 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 you know, one of our leaders some years years ago, he said that uh, he says that we tend to read the scripture from familiar passage to familiar passage, and but there are so many other passages in between that if we actually begin to expose our hearts to it, it begins to tell a fuller story than we can even imagine. Well, verse eleven is one of these verses. He says he says there is no Greek, no Jew, no circumcised, no uncircumcised. No barbarian, no Scythian, no slave, nor free. And then verse 12, he says, therefore, and there it is again, for this reason, in light of this, he goes, as holy and beloved and elect, let's live in this way. He says, let us put on tender mercies. Let's put on kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and so forth. What is happening here is that the list that Paul is highlighting here in verse 11 is an expression of the categories of people that are a part of the church of Colossae. And there are some real dynamics between those two people groups. There, are, there is national or ethnic conflict between Jew and Gentile. There is theological or ideological conflict between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. There is cultural conflict between uh, the civilized people and those people, the barbarians and the Scythians. And there is conflict there's ec uh, 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 amongst economic lines between the slave and the free. And we are all old enough to know that throughout history, each one of these categories, there's always friction between those two groups. And that's the group that Paul is talking to. He says, therefore, as holy and beloved, put on tender mercy, kindness and meekness and mercy and forgiving one another. If you have a complaint against one another, forgive even as Christ forgave. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because the subject of racial conflict, because we've been so taken in by the cultural narrative and the ideologies, we've actually made the answer a whole lot more complicated than it really is. And the Apostle Paul here gives us some real basic answers. How do you respond to someone that belongs to a people group that is different than yours, in particular one that there's a former hostility with or there's a lack of trust there? Paul makes it very simple. Respond in meekness. Respond in kindness. Respond in tenderness. Extend grace and forgiveness. Uh, bear with one another because there are cultural clashes that come with these different things. And so my point in all this is to say, beloved, that there's a very clear roadmap that is in front of us um, in the Word of God in terms of how to move forward. Some of you are already thinking, man, I got to buy this book and that book and this book and that book. You know what? Sure, go for it. But I tell you what, if you're going to pick up a book, pick up 66 of them. <clears throat> and, uh, okay, there you have it. <laughs> 66 and one, very reliable source. And there's a, no, really, there's a lot of insight there. I think that that's really, really the, the pathway that, that we need to go on in these next few years is begin to ask the Lord through the word to help us understand how to move forward. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, great. Let's have uh, uh, Isaac and David and Mike come up. And we just want to have a, just a conversation, just different ones. Uh, our leadership team last Monday, we were just talking about this. Again, we're all going through this book, One Blood. I encourage you to go through it because we're wanting to have a conversation as a spiritual family so that our hearts can just be in a different posture of receiving when Wellington and Chris come. Yes, we have this book. We've got a copy for each family. We've got 100 more. We'll have it on the back table. If you didn't get one for your family... Go ahead and grab one, but don't take more than one if, if you would honor that, just so we can make sure every family gets one. So they'll be on the table back there, and I'm asking everybody 
to read this book before the weekend. So we got about three weeks, about 100 pages or something like that. It's a pretty easy read. It's uh, by John Perkins. We talked about him a little bit last week. He's 92 years old, and he has been a champion of this reality for many, many years. And Rick Warren, you know, of Saddleback Valley Church, he says this is his manifesto, his life manifesto, his final, clearest statement on it. And this is a man that has great authority to make these statements. So we want to learn from them so we can jump into the conversation this, you know, in August uh, 5, 6, and 7 with this in our mind and this in our language and this in our dialogue. Good. Cool. David, go for it. Your last two sermons, I have so many thoughts. Number one, I just want to say this. I so appreciate you taking the issue of race and how we address it out of the realm of apologetics into the realm of tra personal transformation. I just think that's so powerful because apologetics is our reflex. We want to figure out the different arguments and we want to answer those arguments, particularly because we feel like, as it relates to the national conversation, that there's an accusation and the accusation can feel against us that uh, even if you're not consciously aware, you are perpetuating a system. I'm not. And so, the, and so our, act, our accidental response can be a defensive one, which makes apologetics seem helpful as a weapon to ward off the accusation that I'm a racist. But instead, to look at it through a gospel lens is your, your amazing 1 Corinthians 4 point, I'm not aware of anything against myself. I don't know if I'm a racist, but I'm not justified by this, Paul said. I'm not going to rest in what I know about myself. I'm going to put myself before the Lord, and I'm going to have a conversation with Him about this on His terms. I want to see your other point. Romans chapter 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Just think about that phrase in its context for a moment. Because we tend to take do not be conformed to this world and we tend to bring it forward to 2021, 2022. Just for a moment, think about what Paul's saying in the first century. Don't be conformed to this world. In other words, don't think about Israel, Jew, Gentile, in light of what's happening in the world right now. What he's saying is, in essence, when you think about Israel, when you want to take the issue of race and kind of simplify it a bit, you could call it in Paul's context, race being the issue of have and have not. Because, because you have this tension throughout the Bible of two races, Jew and Gentile. That's it. In the Bible, there's the Jews, one race, and everybody else, the other race. That's how the Bible presents the conflict. And the racial conflict of Jew and everybody else is this. The Jews were given something unique to them that was to be a light to the rest of the world. But the problem was they're, they're thinking this means global leadership. We're to be the haves. We're the haves. We have the word. We have the covenants. We have the promises. We have the God of gods, the, the king of kings, the superior God. We have what the rest of the world should have. The rest of the world, the Gentiles, are the have-nots. But the problem is the Gentiles, the Romans, but go all the way back to the Egyptians. The, the Gentiles, the other race, was always in the power position. So the have-nots always had power, and the haves were always in the powerless position. And for a Jew, that created a dynamic of, we're not the inferior race. We have what you should have, but the, but the superior race in their context was not even thinking about them in one sense. To the Romans, it was the Romans and everybody else. They interacted with tons of races, but it was the Romans and everybody else. We, our way is the best way. We have the power. We have the privilege. We have all the stuff. You need what we have. And so you can see the racial tension in their day uh, boiling down to the have and the have-nots. We have what you need. No, we have what you need. And at the end of the day, who's going to rule? Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to be in the place of power to distribute and put everybody else in their place? And so that's how everybody in Paul's time is thinking about it. What's my place? What's your place? What's my rightful place? What's your rightful place? Who's going to be the have? Who's going to be the have not? And Paul goes, stop. Stop. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't think about Israel and the Gentiles on those terms. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We, we now all can access what all should have. 
a steward's point on identity. Such a powerful point. We all now, in Galatians, neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female, all of us now have access, Romans 5, we have access to something glorious, having been justified by faith, not by our power position within the culture. We've been justified by faith. We now have access to something that everybody can have. And the question when it comes to race is, as a Jew, looking at the Gentiles, Paul, do I want the Gentiles to have what I have with equal access? The Gentile, do I want the Jews to have what I have with equal access? In our context, what do, I, do I, as a not black man, do I want, what's the place of the black man in my life and in my society as I understand it through the gospel, not through the political argument that's happening right now? And vice versa, the, the way in which we have the conversation with one another has to be on Pauline terms through the lens of the gospel as it relates to the resource of Christ by the Spirit that we want to see everyone lay hold of. And so, the, and so to me, the thing that I, I, what Stuart's helped me get language for is why I'm so annoyed. I'm so annoyed at the way in which the culture is insisting on changing the conversation and changing the terms to a game we can never win. We're always going to be on defense if we do this the world's way, but actually the last two messages are equipping us to go on offense as it relates to the love of God and the power of the Spirit, and it's beautiful. And so I'm so thankful for these last two messages. Thank you, my friend. Mike. You have a microphone? Yeah. Yeah, Ooh, you. You go, go for it. Hello. Uh, I, I think I just feel conviction. I, as I'm um, looking at like Ephesians 2 more deeply and, and seeing the things that create the barriers and at the very core of humanity lies this sickness of sin called enmity. And if you read it carefully, which I've been trying to do, the enmity is there because of the law and the ordinances, basically because of the favor that was given to the Jewish people, the covenants to become a part of the commonwealth of Israel, to be a child of Abraham. And I'm just realizing how far reaching this issue is um, in my own soul. And I, I think that for, for many years, I kind of just started from the place of, well, I'm not this way so this message doesn't pertain to me. This isn't true about me. And it's hard to go on a journey of understanding if you just assume, like me, that this doesn't pertain to me. I don't have racism in my heart. I'm, I'm not that. And the way that Paul begins to unpack this through the gospel, he begins to show that the core issue is not just racism, but there's an enmity that lies within the human heart that can only be healed by Christ. And so if the enmity can only be touched and forgiven by the power of Christ, then I think we as a nation, we as a church, we desperately need the power of God to move on this issue. And that the human efforts and human endeavors and just getting a bunch of understanding and getting the Bible verses or, or getting the information isn't enough. I need something to happen so deeply inside of me, which has begun at the new birth, but that begins to transform my soul where there's enmity that's just there that I've inherited because I'm a human being. And so I, I'm reading this and you know, listening to, to Stuart and others talk about this, and I, I'm just feeling the conviction of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. I mean, Jesus said that, that the world would know that we're his disciples because of our love. And I'm, I'm just wondering if an unbeliever comes into this spiritual family, do they see the way that we love one another and know that we're Christ's disciples? Are they provoked by that? Is something different about the way that I'm acting towards a person that's different than me, towards a different ethnicity, towards someone that has a different socioeconomic status, a different culture, and are people experiencing me, Isaac Bennett, in a way that's provoking to them where they're going, 
God's in your midst. You must be one of those Jesus follower people. And so I think the more that I'm staring at this, I'm just getting more and more convicted, but I'm not despairing because of that, because I know that, that Jesus is gonna help us and that he cares so deeply and that he named this whole ministry International House of Prayer, and he spoke many times that he's gonna give a grand view of the kingdom from little grand view right here, and I know that has international, ethnic, racial reconciliation uh, uh, connections to that, to that word and to that meaning, and I'm just going, Lord, like, here I am. Like, help me. Like, touch my heart. Convict me. I want to grow in love. I'm thinking of Paul's prayer in Romans 15, one of the apostolic prayers. He says that the Father would grant you to be like-minded, that you would with one mind and one mouth glorify the Lord. And I just keep coming back to that word, grant. And I'm just like, I need something that I don't have on my own. I need Christ and his heart and his passion for the nations and his passion for all people, all men, of all creed, color, language, da 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 da. I need that to touch my heart and to fill me. And so that's where I'm at. Yeah, when I'm viewing this uh, again, I went to Stuart about a year ago, and uh, Stuart took on this new role about almost two years ago, moving on close to two years as, as the uh, uh, giving leadership to our senior leadership team and taking the role that me and Daniels had and kind of put them together and gave it to you. So I've been serving you as you're serving me. And so I went to him about a year ago and I said, Stuart, I feel stirred up about this because some folks have made this Stuart's thing. I said, this is not Stuart's thing. I said, I want to go on record. I am stirred because we're not ready right now for what's about to increase in our culture. And I'm not concerned so much with the question, are we racist, are we not? That's not even the question I'm thinking much about, to be honest, because most of us in this room, when we hear that, we go, that's not me. That, to me, isn't the biggest issue. It might be us, though, uh, more than we think, but maybe not. Here's my uh, issue. We have to have kingdom empathy and kingdom understanding so we can be peacemakers. The uh, Beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers. They're called the sons of God. In a time of ethnic hostility that's going to explode in the earth, God wants uh, some millions of peacemakers who don't want to win arguments. They want to have kingdom empathy. They want to have understanding about why... No, for, regardless which ethnic group we're talking about, why this ethnic group is upset at that ethnic group. And it's not just understanding, but it's kingdom empathy. Meaning, by nature, we all uh, have, our, our natural mindset is, we look across to people different from us, look across the fence, whatever, and we think, why are they responding that way and why do they feel that way? They shouldn't be doing that and they shouldn't feel that way. And the Lord says, no, no, you don't. That's the wrong mindset. It's not that you don't understand why they feel that way. You could make that any one of the ethnic groups. We naturally don't know why they do that and feel that way. People that are way different than us, 50 different type of ethnic groups. But the Lord's saying, understand their aspirations, their good aspirations and their pain and obstacles. Get on their team. Get on their team, not just as virtue signaling to show everybody, man, aren't we something? We're so nice. We're so tolerant. No, because you're my representatives. You're my ambassadors. Those are my kids. Get on their team and help them connect with my heart. And so I'm thinking we, I don't think like quote the typical what people think racism. That's the problem with a bunch of folks in this room. Our problem is we're pretty okay being happy about people, but we're not on their team. We don't understand the obstacles and the plight and the pain. We don't understand even wrong mindsets. We don't have right conversations. We're like, huh, sorry. And the Lord says, that's not good enough. Sorry, I don't want to be a problem, but I don't feel that way. That's not good enough. They're my kids. Whether it's, uh, you know, all, again, there's 50 types of different racial conflicts going on in the earth, and they're all in our nation as well. And that's not, and I think black and white is at the forefront, but it's way beyond black and white. 
I want to be a man of the kingdom. I want to see that man's plight, that obstacle, see his aspirations, understand them. Even if I don't understand them, I want to learn them and go, wow, okay, how can I help? And we can't help everybody at everything, but there's going to be kingdom opportunities that are going to come our way that are going to surprise us. One here, one there, one here, one there, one here, and we've got to be equipped for, for this. Like, for instance, I'll give a couple uh, conversations that I've had with uh, Bishop Javert. Am I saying it right? I always say that because it's a French name. From Detroit. He's with the Lord now. This man came, what, eight years ago, ten years ago, something like that, spent five hours one day talking to us, an African-American leader in Detroit, and Detroit is one of the cities of the most intense racial conflict of black, white, but also Muslim, Christian. There's about five of them going. It's really intense. And he's the only man of the three big uh, uh, car uh, companies, corporations there, the only man that has sat on the top senior leadership of all three of them. He got his PhD, an incredibly brilliant man. So no person has ever been at the top of Ford, Chrysler, and the other one, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> haven't been on, except for him. And he's a black man. And he was telling the story. He says, and when I went 10 years here, 10 years there, 10 years there, and he kept getting promoted, he goes, I would have white guys, three levels, departments lower than me, would not accept me. My resume was not good enough. And they were born-again believers. And they had people in their departments that they did not accept me. They pushed back against me because of the color of my skin. And believers who were their friends and maybe under them would get in trouble if they spoke up about this. So everybody was deadly quiet because the two or three ranks below, I mean believers, and going, well, hey, who are you to do this? And again, their coworkers were silent and they're believers too. And they're going, uh, mm, I'll probably get fired if I speak up because my boss doesn't like that guy even though that guy's way over him. He goes, there was a deadly silence through the system in the house of God in those corporations. He goes, and then, I, because I got so many high promotions, the black community thought I was, you know, pandering to the whites. They were really mad at me for being promoted so high. And the white community, I had some that accepted me. I'm, again, especially the very top because they gave them the top position. He, and he, I said, Bishop Javert, talk to me. Tell me stuff. Tell me what we don't know. He says, okay. And it took a, about an hour or two. He really believed I was serious. So he says, okay, I'm going to give you some stuff. Okay. He goes, in Detroit, it's happening in Kansas City. Guarantee you. He goes, we have uh, places where people live where there's economic systems that keep them in those places. Uh, he's talking about the blacks in some of the areas. And he explained those systems. Very, very uh, real intelligent guy. He says, and their school systems are horrible. They don't have money. They don't have the same quality of teachers. So the 12-year-old boy doesn't read very well. This is generation after generation or decade after decade. He goes, that 12-year-old boy now is 15. He can get a real good job working with some of the gangs, make a lot of good money because he can't get a job because he can't read good, but his praying mom is heartbroken, and the white community goes, get with it. What's your problem? You know, tell the boy to go get a job. She goes, most, many in our neighborhood, they couldn't read well. And then they make wrong decisions when they're 15 because they get a lot of money. And then they go to prison and then and then and then. And I go, ugh, ugh, ugh. He goes, now let me tell you about you now. I said, because again, in a few hours we started connecting. He goes, there's probably, I don't know Kansas City, three school systems probably within 10 miles of your house. And that's happening. And you don't even know. And that's okay for you to continue to go on with these kids stuck in this unprivileged system that's breaking them and their praying moms are heartbroken and it never even enters your mind. But you're not racist. Of course you're not racist. But it's never even crossed your mind what they're going through. They're only 10 miles from here and you're all in the kingdom. He goes, you're not the guy to go fix everything. But maybe if you understood about 10 more situations, which he told me, he goes, you would go, wow, how could we just be so happy and so quiet? It's like that deadly silence of those car, you know, those corporations that the believers against believers, I mean, believers with believers wouldn't speak up. And he goes, you, there, these school systems that's happening right now, your church is growing, you're a happy guy, 
You pray a little bit about it. You're not heartbroken. They love Jesus as much as you do, and they love their kids as much as you love their kids, and they're 10 minutes down the road, but you're not racist, but you're completely disconnected with reality of the kingdom in your city. And he gave me about five more examples. And I said, I, I need to get schooled here. <laughs> I mean, this is not okay with me. I didn't think that way. And so the question, are you racist? Maybe that's not even the right question. Do you have kingdom empathy? I don't mean virtue signaling where you're being a hot shot, showing everybody how much you care and that's your, kind of your, your new identity to be the one that talks a lot, but don't, you know. Could you get in the gap with somebody, have a conversation, not answer all of their questions as to why you're not bad, hear their pain, let them say it wrong, and you hear them and actually feel something about what they're going through, that's kind of step one. And those are the things I want us to be equipped on. Now, I'll tell you a second example. It's our little, our little guy, Justice. You know, uh, uh, Jay Thomas's son and Naomi. I'm at a funeral with uh, Jay Thomas is up front singing, and it's a funeral, and he, Justice is the back. Maybe he's five years old or so, something like that. I'm at the back with him. I see him, so I go sit down with him because I always punch on him and, you know, I throw the football with him some, and we have a, just a fun little interchange. I go, Justice, how do you feel? Five years old. He has no rhetoric, no racial conflict rhetoric at all. He goes, there's about 200 people at the, at the funeral. He goes, mostly everyone in the room is white. He goes, I'm embarrassed. I go, embarrassed? I'm thinking, I'm sad it's a funeral, or, or I'm mad my dad brought me here instead of the baseball game, or embarrassed. I go, why are you embarrassed, Justice? He goes, no one looks like me. He goes, I'm embarrassed. I want to leave. Now, this is not a boy who's been taught how bad white people are. His parents love white people. He's not heard any of that. It's a human heart. Just That's how a human heart feels. He wouldn't taught that. So, I mean, there's another guy who's been taught things, and he has a certain mindset. And I thought, yeah, there, there's, this thing's deeper than we understand about different human beings. I mean, I said, Lord, this is remarkable. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell him that fun story about my neighbor. This is a fun story, isn't it? <laughs> this is a biz really bizarre Beautiful, bizarre. So I live about, we live for the last 15 years in a, in a place about a mile from IHOP on, in Calico. Most of our neighbors are African Americans. And the duplex next to us in 15 years, three different families have lived there for about five years each. And whenever, they've always been a black family, whenever they are, I knock on their door and I say, hello, my name's Mike. I just welcome you to the neighborhood. I want you to know, I'm thinking of a bunch of you guys in the neighborhood. I go, there's a lot of really good people around here, really good. And you're going to find out that it's going to be a blessing. And they said, well, thank you. And so first I go over there, and the 15 and 16-year-old boy, they're in the yard. I talk to them for a while. And they go, our parents are right upstairs. Why don't you go talk to them and tell them this too? And so I go up there and talk to them. And I asked him where he worked, and he told me. He goes, well, where do you work? I said, well, you, when you drove by here, did you see that shopping mall called International House of Prayer? He goes, yeah, I, go, I work there. And they said, oh, we've heard of that place. I said, oh, cool. I go, how did you hear about it? I go, they said, through a book called The Last Vein. I said, I, I never, I don't, I've never heard of the book. I go, who, like, what, what, I don't understand. He goes, well, there's this book called The Last Vein, this lady named Lisa Stribling. I go, oh. Oh, I wrote the foreword for it. I just didn't look at the title. <laughs> so I don't tell them that yet. And I go, and she is at Hope City. I go, how did you get the book? She goes, well, our nephew gave it to us. I go, your nephew, why? Wow. She goes, well, our nephew, Kevin, oh, he said our nephew, married Lisa Stribling's daughter, so that, that's, that's my niece, you know? So I haven't said nothing yet. And I said, really? I go, yeah. I go, and they talk about an IHOP. And so we've heard, we saw it. We just moved in at like two days ago, so we've never been there yet. And we love the Lord. And I said, uh, is that boy, is his name Kevin? I go, how would you know Kevin? I said, well, you're not going to believe this, but I've actually played touch football with him about five times. She goes, how would you know Kevin? I said, well, he's married to Lisa Stribling. That's my sister, her, her daughter. 
he's actually in my family now. And I showed him a picture and they go, what? And then they show a picture and they got Lisa's daughter in the family. And so she goes, I go, I was at the wedding. She goes, oh, you're the white guy that prayed at the wedding. I loved it. I go, yeah. She goes, we were so happy because we thought, Kevin, maybe there's a chance. Maybe these, these stribbling people love Jesus. But it, that white guy that prayed, he sounded like he loved Jesus. Like, that was me. They go, oh, we don't remember exactly what you look like. But yeah, unbelievable. So here, here's the funny part. <laughs> well, that's already kind of strange. But I go, the boys are downstairs still outside. I go, hey, boys. <laughs> They, 15, 16, they come out, I go, they're standing there, I go, hey, I either got good news or bad news, I'm not sure how you're gonna take it. And they're, because I don't know them, their eyes, they go, what? I go, I'm your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, what? And the mom goes, he is, he's your uncle. <laughs> I said, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'm your uncle. <laughs> and so we have this friendship in our neighborhood with these love Jesus people, and I'm thinking, what's the chances of that? I mean, we could be out in the front yard talking, even praying. Conflict increases in our neighborhood. There's going to be a picture right there in that neighborhood of, I mean, I'm related to 80 people by blood or marriage within 10 miles of IHOP, 80 of us by blood or marriage. I mean, I got a big family. But I'm, and they love Lisa, and I'm thinking we could be in our front yard together just celebrating or, you know, just doing things, having even a prayer meeting. I don't mean just that. Lord, this thing is set up so perfectly. And so isn't that just, so I said, we've really got to, I want to learn things more. I want to understand more. I don't want to be the white guy who's real generous that, hey, I'll give you money because I'm white and I'm good and I want you to know I'm good. I don't want to be that. I don't want even, some folks are really offended by that. Like, oh, you're going to save us again. Thank you. There's so many things that are not uh, 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 intuitive to any human heart. We have to be taught and brought into kingdom empathy. Again, all the different races together. But this is a beautiful thing that we can be peacemakers of the kingdom. Stuart, I'll, be, I'll finish with this, but 20 years ago, I mean, I helped 23 years ago, so I guess 23 years ago, whatever. Stuart was the first guy that I ever heard when I read the Bible, I read Jew and Gentile. He said, that's black and white. I never thought of Gentile as a racial conflict with Jews. I mean, I knew the kind. I mean, yeah, I knew it, but I never. Then I, he started going through Ephesians like he did today. And this Trophimus, this guy from Ephesus, from Turkey, he is a, full on against Jews and they're really against this Gentile from Turkey, which is Ephesus. And when he brought him in the temple and Paul said, I'm doing this, I love, he's already said it a couple times, because it's in the Father's heart. I'm actually in prison because I won't, I won't be okay if the Gentiles, which the racial conflict was so intense, and Stuart's the first one to let me see the black, I will, oh, that's all about what we're talking about. I never, because I just saw Gentiles and I, you know, what the, didn't think much about it. It is the most intense thing. And so then again, I'm going to hit the, the uh, Galatians 2 thing that he mentioned. Peter and Barnabas, they're at this dinner with Gentiles. And uh, you call them the bros from Jerusalem. And the leaders from Jerusalem came up to see what was happening at the church there. And Peter already saw the Gentile leader, I mean the Jewish leaders, some of his good friends who traveled to the setting there, Peter backed away and said, I don't want to be caught eating with the white guys or eating with the black guys. I'm going to get in trouble because it was really intense. And then Paul stands up and says, Peter, you're a hypocrite. He called him out in front of everyone. He goes, you backed away? I'll go to prison for this. Why? Because I'm good? No, because it's in my father's heart to have an international family of affection I'll go to prison for this cause, and you're backing away because the bros from Jerusalem may not understand. He goes, how dare you, Peter? I mean, he rebuked him openly. I mean, it was intense. And so I'm thinking this weekend, we're just pushing the conversation forward. 
But this, the reason I want us all leading into it, because the tip, I mean, before I met uh, Bishop Javert, I just thought, hey, I love blacks, whites, I love everything. He goes, yeah, but you're completely uninvolved, and it's 10 miles away, and it's horrible what's happening, and they love Jesus, and you don't even know. Not that you've got to fix it, but if you knew it, you will be in kingdom opportunities of conversations. You can make a big difference. And then, again, five fam three families in a row for five years at a time live next door to me. And I've had some beautiful kingdom moments. But I go, I still don't know enough. I still don't feel enough. I, I got to get this ball moving forward. So it's not an issue. You're a racist. No, I'm not a racist. Yes, you are a racist. No, you're not a racist. I mentioned last week, this is my fifth final point. <laughs> Hope Probably my last one. But I mentioned this last week that a couple years ago, I was in 216 when Trump was running. I was saying that the eight or nine little black boys in the neighborhood I throw the football with. And that's the only thing I can do is throw football. I can't sing, dance, or dribble or nothing, but I can throw football. So that's the only thing I can do with those kids. And so I asked them. I said, hey, boys. I go, election's coming up. I go, what do you think about Trump? And they all said, he's a racist. And I said, why is he a racist? Everyone knows he's a racist. My mama said he's a racist. And they go, everyone knows. Now, I, and I'm not acting like a hotshot here. I didn't want to correct them at all. I wanted to understand what's in the heart of a little eight-year-old boy, a little 10-year-old boy, regardless which race we're talking about, regardless what country, it's the same everywhere, nation against nation. It's all over Asia. It's all over Africa. It's all over Europe. And I wanted to hear them. I go, are you scared? They go, yeah. I go, why were you scared? You know, he's racist. I go, what will he do as a racist? They'll hurt us. How will they hurt you? We don't know. But uh, I go, you know, there's, there's a, the Lord is moving on a lot of people, and people are starting to learn to love each other in a whole new way. And they go, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. My, that's what my mom says stuff like that too. But anyway, but I just said, these little 8 and 10-year-old boys, they're not like, they just, that's just normal. If you went to the other side of town, to the other nation, they would say the same thing about the opposite race. We've got a job to do, and I want to be a solution in this city and not kind of a happy, I'm, you know, I'm colorblind. I don't know nothing. I'm good. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. People are suffering and they're afraid and they're hurting. Some things they're hurting. They need to not hurt, and other things are hurting that you don't understand at all, and other things are hurting that will totally or just perplex you. We don't need to know everything right and wrong. We just need to be there. I'm wondering if, just real quick, I'm wondering if, you know, Trophimus uh, comes up in Acts chapter 21, then Paul goes to prison because of Trophimus and writes Ephesians and Philippians, a few other letters from prison, and uh, his name, Trophimus' name, means nourish or instructed, and I'm wondering if this is like this name that keeps coming up in the conversations and Stuart, you know, highlighting this story, if this is like a prophetic moment for us. And, and this isn't normally typically my way, like, you know, the real prophetic imagery stuff. But I wonder if- Well, with your parents, you ought to be flowing. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, mom and dad. I'm not really, no. I mean, no, uh, no, I'm just wondering if the Lord is putting this, this figure, uh, Trophimus, before us and Paul's stand with him, for him, for the sake of the gospel. It wasn't about for the sake of my buddy, that my friend that I'm so deeply committed to. Paul was taking a stand, yes, for that, but more than that, for the sake of the gospel and was willing to go to prison for it. And Trophimus, that name meaning nourished and instructed, and I think that's just such an incredible picture of what the Lord is inviting our spiritual family into, even as we anticipate this weekend in August, that the Lord would both nourish us, that he would strip strengthen us and that he would we would be instructed with gospel understanding and gospel language i just I, i'm stirred by this trophimus guy hey benji come up here real quick please benji's grew up in mexico his whole life i've talked to benji a few times i go benji have you ran into any animosity against you because you're mexican oh yeah but yeah. you know what? Most folks in this room wouldn't understand it. I've asked you that a couple times. Yeah. And you said this and this and this. And I went, gee whiz. No, he goes, yeah, and the Hispanic community all around Kansas City and Grandview, they're feeling the same thing. And I could get any of my Asian friends and say, have you felt anything? So I'm going, to, yeah, for sure I have. And it's, we're in this thing together. Just give us a minute. Yeah, I, I was just thinking how 
two things. First, I'm, I'm preparing to help Elodie, which my, is your daughter, my daughter navigate that she looks Hispanic, but she's American and has a and her mom's a Canadian a brother. Yeah, and a brother is white with blue eyes, and a mom that is white and blue eyes. And just a few months ago, she she came to me and said, "Dad, why you and me are black like Stuart?" <laughs> Say, we're brown, but close enough. <laughs> That's why he likes you probably so much, like, Stuart. Um, he likes you too. Well, and just yeah. so you know, she was bragging. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I know. Uh, so it's like you were saying, like, uh, Jay's son. That the is, little part is, doesn't even know. It yeah. doesn't know, has no nothing. I mean, she has the whole spectrum in her family, right? But it's there. And I'm, I'm just thinking the, the commandment. But was uh, she confused? Was she, or just curious? Curious, like, oh, but why, why are we black and mommy's white? <laughs> like, and we're white, we're black like Stuart. <laughs> I love that, that's her reference. Like, well, love close that. enough, but we're more brown, but yeah, yeah, we're black. <laughs> um, but I, I'm thinking on the commandment of Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2, and how we have an exercise in front of us. And the commandment is comfort, comfort my people. He says it three times, comfort and speak comfort to my people and, and cry out to them. And uh, we are commanded by the Lord in the end times to not just say, oh, I'm going to lecture the Jewish people in flight of how you guys are wrong or how. It's not a lecture. It's comfort and cry. And it's the both. apologetic thing he was saying. We yeah, don't want to win it, arguments. We really don't want to no, we engage can. in that. It's cry. It's even involved our emotions. And it's a commandment. That is going to be around the corner for us. So us looking at the white and black, black, brown <laughs> conflict, it's not an option for us. If we actually want to comfort the Jewish people, which is Isaiah 40, is the forerunner cry, right? And so we're going to be confronted with that conversation to come from people that are going to be, you know, suffering the anti-Semitism, the all, of, all kinds of pain. And we have to exercise that empathy that you're talking about. Because it doesn't matter if they're wrong on some stuff. We don't have to be their corrector. We yeah. have to stand in the heart. We don't tell them wrong things are right, but we're going to hear them and love them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not even close. Like, I'm, I'm with you on, on the same, in the same posture of heart. Like, I am not even prepared to, to be like Paul. I'm provoked by Paul to go to prison, to be, you know, in this discomfort for something that it was wrong to me. I was trying to do the right thing, and now I'm bearing the stigma. Like those guys in Detroit, those born-again believers, three departments down, would they go to prison for the black man standing, speaking up for the black man? No, they wouldn't even lose their job. They wouldn't even talk to their superior. Yeah. They were all quiet. He goes, deadly silence in the whole organization. Yeah, and, and be willing to bear the stigma of never being understood and being accused of something that is not even who you are. And still love God and write that letter. Because he wrote Ephesians in that context. That to me, the whole six chapters, but he's talking about spiritual warfare and all of these things that are like, it's not, it, it was not created or written in a vacuum of just apologetical stuff. It was, he can write that kind of stuff. In the heat of racial yeah, conflict. Of being misunderstood and taken by a racist and whatever. That to me, I'm like, but, but that's the standard. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm like, I'm not, might be black or white, but we're all in this conflict, and we, we need to lean. Because we got to be ambassadors. We want to be healers. Yeah. The, uh, C.S. Lewis said it, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. And uh, the thing that we have to remember as a people is that, again, when we reduce the racial conversation to the cultural level and, uh, and live on the defensive to get out of it, we end up in a place of justified indifference because we, we've answered the woke argument and we feel justified in the answer and so we feel comfortable in our indifference because we have the apologetic. But, but the Lord's not addressing us primarily as you know, white people with privilege. The Lord's addressing us as intercessors. In other words, the, the reason that the Lord is addressing the race issue with us 
isn't just so that we change the way we relate. He's looking to change our prayer conversation to change our intercession in the prayer room. It's really about that. If, if, if there's a breakthrough in, the, in Mike's point, we just, you said it after Ferguson years ago, and then you said it last week. The, as Ferguson is exploding, you said, hey, here's the answer. Have a black man, have a, have a black family over for dinner. That's, that was the solution at the time. And then you said last week, just want the person in front of you. Love the person in front of you. Just keep it simple. It's just what you're describing right now. But, but we want that to translate. In other words, as we really begin to engage with one another, as we talk to the Lord and one another about this issue, God's goal with us as a family is always the same, that the conversations we have with one another would ultimately inform our intercession in that room. So if this is coming up now, it's not just to prepare for a future conflict, it's to engage in a present assignment. And we can't forget that because the present assignment does not allow us to sit in indifference because we don't know what to do or we haven't read the five books. The Lord goes, you don't have to read the five books or feel powerless related to future crisis. I can change the way you pray for your city and the people around you and the school systems right now. We can start changing that intercession right now, and then suddenly we realize, oh, this isn't about me as an American trying to figure out the progressive threat to our educational system and legal system. I don't have to figure that out. I got to figure out how to pray for the families of my neighborhood and the school system and the economic dynamics. I can do that in a prayer room. I can start that tomorrow at 6 a.m. or tonight at midnight. I can do that right now. And that conversation and our intercession, just again, I just want us to, it's about taking our assignment seriously. The Lord made a point, not just setting us in Kansas City, but setting us in Grandview. The Lord made a point of it. And so if you're going, okay, I'm uh, you know, I'm Thai. Why do we always got to talk about black and white? The Lord made a point. Wait, make that point. You're Thai. I don't know if they understand what you just said. I'm tough. I'm, uh, my mom's from Thailand. And you said you grew up in New York. Yeah. With white people against you. I mean, you gave us quite a story the other day about you grew up as the bad guy. I mean, as the oppressed. Yeah, I, uh, I looked super Asian when I was a kid. And so, uh, so I grew up in New York and Alabama. When I was in Alabama, I never heard anything about my appearance or my race or my ethnic background. When I was in Alabama, they would hit me for being a Yankee from the north. When I was in New York, I found out that I was Asian. And so uh, through, many, <laughs> through many pretty, pretty horrible ways. So, the, uh, so anyways, my point is the Lord made a point of setting me, little Thai boy, the, the Lord made a point of setting me into a context to intercede that has a really complex racial history that formed the way that we think about it. In other words, it's, it's pretty unique, this nation and what happened in the 1800s and what was set and imprinted within the culture is impacting this culture today. That's the culture we've been set into, not just as Americans, Think about yourself as this. You've been set here as an intercessor. You've been set into Grandview as an intercessor. You've been set into a nation with a complex racial history as an intercessor. And the point of these conversations is how the Lord wants us not just to message in the days to come, but to intercede tomorrow. Amen. Let's all just stand. I just want to close up in prayer. So I'm just, David found out he was Asian. When he went to we, New York. <laughs> when he went to, that's an interesting statement. <laughs> it is hilarious. Let's just stand before the Lord. Father, here we are. Lord, you have uh, brought us, just even as David said, Lord, you've brought us here for such a time as this. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would give us uh, ears to hear, eyes to see. Lord, I just pray that you would even just show us how to pray even as Dave just talked about. Lord, I just ask you for revelation. Lord, even in the next few weeks, Lord, I just pray that you would just open up new dimensions of the Holy Spirit. Lord, new insight through your word. Lord, I pray that like you would even re would release dreams in the night. Lord, I just pray, Lord, let your grace abound, Lord, on this spiritual family still more and more and more. Grace, grace to this body, Father, as we go forward with you in this. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.